Hi, I'm Alexandra Matthews, and tonight we're talking about Candyman, the 2021, what I thought was a reimagining, but it turns out to be somewhat of a sequel. I'll do a spoiler-free review, and then I'll get into talking about the movie and giving some spoilers. So this first part um, is just the spoiler-free. The movie really expands on the original story. I know that there were a couple of sequels that I've seen, but I haven't seen them in a really long time. But this movie, the 2021 version, seems to just go back to the original movie and expand upon that legend and continue on some stories of some of the characters from that movie. The movie also has parts where they're using like marionettes and shadows to help tell the story and I think that it's really effective and a really nice touch to make the storytelling more interesting or um, compelling in a way just different. Um, and I think it works really well with the Candyman theme because it's like kids and candy um, and the marionettes obviously are like more of a childish form of entertainment. So I thought it all tied in really well and made for um, a nice visual. The main character is a man named Anthony who is an artist. And I really liked that because if you've seen the original Candyman, then you know that he was an artist himself. So it's cool that the main character is also an artist in this new movie and ties those two themes together. The movie centers around him and how in the beginning he doesn't know what his ties are to the, the original legend. He'd never heard of it and how he kind of descends into madness um, as he's discovering this legend and his part in all of it. Overall, I thought it was a solid movie. It did go by pretty quickly. At least it felt that way. I actually didn't look at how long it was but I just, I think that's what happens when you're just really into a movie. Um, it doesn't, it just feels like it's, it flies by. In the end, there's a little bit of, I guess, CGI that I wasn't a big fan of, but it wasn't horrendous. Um, I did feel like because I hyped the movie up so much in my mind that... It, it left me wanting a little bit more. Um, just because it's such a big legend, it's it's such a huge movie. Um, I don't know necessarily what it was lacking or what I was wanting, but um, I but I, overall I really I really can't complain because it wasn't a, a bad movie at all. And, um, you know, it's another kind of horror movie that makes you, it reminds you that the real horrors are in real life. And anything that's like, a, you know, paranormal um, horror kind of pales in comparison to just like the real life human monsters. Well, real life, you know monsters that are, are live humans. I would definitely recommend that you go see it. Um, and if you have seen it and you wanna discuss some details, then keep watching. The movie started out with a different Candyman legend. You know, the original Candyman legend is from the 1800s. It's, um, I think his name, Daniel Robitaille. This artist, <clears throat> this black artist who was commissioned to paint 
a uh, man's white daughter and then they fall in love and she has a baby and then he gets killed um, by being beaten, covered in honey, stung, and burned. But they, they start this movie with a different Candyman legend, which again is what made me think that this was a reimagining, but this new Candyman legend from the 1970s is just one in this line of people that have been brutalized by other people, whether it be police or other groups of people. Um, and that was kind of the whole point of the movie, really. What, what ultimately tied it together was it's like they're the one person, it's a problem or um, things that have happened that have happened to so many people. And it's it's just bigger than any one legend or any one person because there's so many people kind of in a long line of horrific stories that end in similar ways. Um, William, who's a character in this movie, said that, I think the quote was, um, Candyman is not, not one man or one bee, it's the whole hive. So that made me understand a little bit more about why they had this different Candyman. Um, the new Candyman or the newer Candyman from the 1970s legend in this movie is this man, um, crap, I don't recall what his character's name is, but he is a neighborhood uh, man who has a hook for a hand um, don't recall how he got his hook, but he would go around the neighborhood and give kids candy. And then when razor blades started showing up in the candy, he was blamed and the police came after him and beat him to death. And then it was a couple weeks later when razor blades continued to show up in candy when they realized that this candy man was innocent, but he still comes back. As this vengeful spirit and William we see him as a child and as an adult and he grows up and later on continues to live in Cabrini Green and he will wind up meeting Anthony and telling him the story um, because Anthony has not heard of any of this and he grew up in the area even though I did understand why they portrayed the legend the way that they did to, to give a bigger message. I still would have loved to have seen more of Tony Todd, the original Candyman, Daniel Robitaille. I would have liked to have seen him more just because he really is, obviously him being the titular character of the original movie, obviously he would be the reason why the movie was so... Um, big being the main character but beyond that he just like did the character so well and he's so somewhat synonymous like he he is Candyman you know and when you watch the original movie he's this magnetic force like he's just really great to watch you know he's got that voice that's really commanding he's got the stature I think he's really tall in real life um just one of those personalities and just overall like has something as a person that makes you drawn to him um i think that the the actor that that did the 70s version of candy man did a really good job too he was a very very sympathetic character um you know showed a lot of pain in his face but also was really menacing when he was exacting his revenge or coming back when anybody said his name five times the movie seemed to really drive home how you have to keep legends alive. You have to, um, you know, the tagline is say his name and they, throughout the movie, they'll tell people to say it, say Candyman five times because the more you 
talk about something, the more you bring it to life, the more people know about it, the more it can live. And, um, you know, and then if you don't talk about it and details get lost or you replace one story with another, um, then stories get lost and these, um, the people and the legends lose their power. And then kind of, you know, speaking about it from a horror perspective, um, Freddy Krueger is my favorite horror villain and Nightmare on Elm Street is my favorite um, horror franchise and Nightmare 4 is my favorite movie of all time. I always laugh after that because I think it does sound kind of random, but it is. Um, and it's kind of similar with him too in, in terms of in certain movies if um, like in Freddy's Revenge when the kids die off from the town there's no one there to remember him and he loses his power he doesn't have anybody else to haunt it's kind of similar in that way if you think about it from a purely horror perspective and, and, and similar villains that are more on the supernatural end another part that I thought was kind of interesting and I think it was purposeful was in the original Candyman, Helen Lyle in the end became a legend like Candyman. And in this movie, um, it talks about how it, it seems that Helen Lyle overshadowed the Candyman character for a while and she became a bigger legend. And that speaks to, you know, um, I don't know. It's kind of an uncomfortable talk topic to talk about, I think. But you know, um, they mentioned in the movie that if, like, when Helen um, was killed in this neighborhood, it made bigger news than when the residents were killed. And so, um, I think that for a time when Helen for know a couple decades a few decades when Helen Lyle's legend overshadowed Candyman it kind of speaks to that so getting back to the character of William he bumps into Anthony when Anthony is taking pictures of Cabrini Green because Anthony has learned about the area from his girlfriend's brother who tells him about this legend and Anthony's girlfriend Brianna live in these nice you know high-rise apartments or condos that used to where Cabrini Green or part of Cabrini Green used to stand and there's part of Cabrini Green in the movie that still stands that most of it is abandoned but some people still stay there one of which is William and I thought it was kind of weird how when Anthony was there taking pictures, William just like struck up this conversation with a stranger. But it kind of makes sense later on when you see what has happened to William and how he pretty much knows upon meeting Anthony that who he is and what his being there means. And with another tie to the original movie with um, Anthony and Brianna's apartments being on the ground where Cabrini Green stood, it reminds me a lot also of the first Candyman movie where, um, where Helen Lyle discovers that um, her apartments were meant to be, I think, another phase of Cabrini Green or they were like the blueprints were based off of it but they instead were made into these really expensive condos and then she discovers that you know there's holes behind these medicine cabinets and then finds a way to um, use this when she's exploring Cabrini Green so there's another tie to the first movie but Anthony goes there because he's kind of burning out a little bit in his art. He um, was really prominent in the art scene in Chicago and then kind of recycled his old work and people wanted to see something new so he thought that he would take a trip to Cabrini Green, um, kind of similar 
in a way where Helen Lyle was using this story for her thesis for her graduate research project. Anthony is using it for his artwork so that he can get new inspiration. And while he's there, he gets stung by a bee in his hand. And this bee sting grows and grows and grows, especially after people start dying after his mirror art exhibit. It's just this medicine cabinet. Um, you can open it up and see other artwork that, um, but it, it tells people to say Candy Man's name five times, and then people start doing that and they start dying. And as this is going on, this infection or this infestation or this possession starts growing up Anthony's arm up onto his face, onto one side of his body, he gets this milky eye and really starts to spiral mentally. And in the end, almost just seems like he's completely possessed. Like he's this um, like vessel for the soul of Candyman or something. So back to William and how he kind of ties into all of this. Um, William, when he was a kid, saw the other Candyman be, well, he was nearby when the 1970s Candyman was beaten to death by police. And then he started seeing him. He saw him in his sister's bathroom where she was saying his name. And he killed William's sister. So he also seems to have been drawn, driven crazy by the Candyman legend. He knew who Anthony was right away when he saw him taking photos and in his mind thought that Anthony was meant to come back. He was meant to carry on the legend of Candyman. They're in this church um, that's dilapidated and while Anthony is in this trance or is possessed whatever you want to call it. Brianna is tied up because William is sawing off William's hand, which Anthony at this point mildly notices because he's so far gone. And he puts the coat on Anthony, you know, and gives him the, the look, the silhouette, you know, of a new candy man. And he calls 911 to get the cops there to kind of stage this new iteration or incarnation of the legend. But um, Brian is able to get away and she She, you know, is able to escape William and the police wind up coming um, and pretty much no questions asked shoot Anthony who's really in the process of being taken over and no longer living. Um, but one of the things I didn't mention was obviously he's the baby from the original story and his mom wanted to protect him so that he can live a normal life and not get sucked into the candy man legend that ter terrified her so much um but the police come and shoot anthony no questions asked and basically threaten brianna to keeping to this story. Otherwise, they're going to say that she was an accomplice to the Candyman. And it really shows the fear that people have 
and the corruption that happens. And then in a movie like this, in a horror movie, how something manifests from that. And um, that's kind of how that ends, is Anthony kind of comes back and deals with the police officers. And then in the end, the, the terrible CGI that I referenced was Brianna sees Candyman kind of levitating with this these bees all around him and then the bees part and you see Daniel Robitaille's face looking younger um, because Tony Todd, who played Daniel Robitaille, is much older now. And um, he tells Brianna, um, I think he says like, to, you know, basically to keep the story going, say it, say my name, something like that. I was a little distracted in the movie theater. Um, my mom was texting with me because my grandma passed away. So like all that happened when I was in the movie theater. So I was trying to pay attention to it, but also like I had to be texting with my mom because all that stuff was going on. So apologies if um, I've missed anything, <laughs> but uh, so as I said, overall, I think it was a pretty, I think my camera is about to die. Yeah, I gotta wrap this up. Solid movie. Go see it. And if you like this video, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Why is my battery dying? My phone, my, my camera was plugged. Maybe it's just running out of space. Fuck. I don't know. I'm so confused. Okay.